All right, so you see there uh, the image among those yesterday of the Yankees losing again, this time to Cleveland. Ryan Rucco called the game last night. Ryan, as you may know, is a host on ESPN Radio in New York, and it's been fun times lately. Not for Yankees fans, though, Ryan. So let me ask you, they drop a game and a half out of first place in the AL East. What's the issue with their scoring? Why can't they put runs on the board like they have been? And are they going to make any adjustments in that regard? You know, right now, Joe Girardi doesn't plan to do anything to shake up the order, Hannah, because he says, hey, what can I do? If nobody's hitting, there's nobody to move up in the order. And right now, that's the reality of the situation. And the Yankees, one through five in their order, was the strength of this team throughout the first four months of this season. But over the last four games, they are five for 83. That is a 0 6 0 batting average. Oh. They're all hitting under 200 in the month of August. And Jacoby Ellsbury is probably the most problematic because his struggles have gone on longer than anybody else's. And when he is not getting on base, it puts more onus on the rest of the offense to go yard. And right now, they're not doing that, and they don't have their table setters getting on. Ellsbury is hitting under 200 since he came off the DL. It's not a small sample size anymore. That was early July when he returned. And Joe Girardi gave him a day off yesterday, not just because they're in the stretch of playing 16 straight days and they came off a 16-inning game, but he actually wanted Ellsbury to take some time to work on some things. So we'll see whether or not Ellsbury was able to figure anything out. But it's funny, I, I do my show in New York and you have fans saying, well, this is why they should have made a move at the deadline for a pitcher. Pitching has been fine. They right. pitched to a 2-2 ERA over their last seven games. They're 1-6 in, in that stretch because they have a total of nine runs in the last seven games. That after having 90 in the previous 10. If they don't hit, Hannah, if one through five doesn't hit, they're not going to win. That's been the strength of this team. Right. It's just been the worst kind of dominant no effect uh, with their hitters and six runs in the last five games. Yeah, not going to get it done. Okay, let's talk about the Mets, though. Uh, they win again. Another strong performance from Jacob deGrom. He throws seven shutout innings. He strikes out ten Rockies. Uh, the Mets fans, as you know, talk to them all the time. They have this really healthy dose of skepticism. They almost don't want to believe it, right? Uh, but the Mets have won ten of their last twelve. How do they figure to sustain this down the stretch? because their pitching is so good, and now they get representative at bats, Hannah. I mean, as good as their pitching is, DeGrom and Harvey, Syndergaard have been even better lately. And then offensively, they have a bevy of hitters who really can at least put together a professional at bat, whether it's Kelly Johnson or it's Juan Uribe, or now you have Yoenis Cespedes, who's probably the Mets' best hitter. They got Travis Darno back. David Wright may be on the way. They put together a lineup against Clayton Kershaw a few weeks ago that we all looked at and we said, oh, well, they're in all likelihood going to be no hit tonight. And they were getting perfect gamed into the seventh inning. From that moment on, they made the changes they needed to to their offense. They've gotten just enough to get by to go along with that pitching when they score at least four runs they're 44 and 7 this season so they don't need a lot to win and now they have enough guys and you got to remember too when you're in the National League you need a deeper bench you need guys who you can send up in spots and feel comfortable enough with their at bats and now because of the way they've added some professional hitters they have lengthened their lineup and they've lengthened their bench and they just have guys who you feel like even if they're not great they're good enough to support what is an excellent pitching staff oh I mean it's just like old times for Mets fans. Uh, they lead now by three and a half games. All right, now, I know you spent a lot of time on this, and I'm just wondering uh, what the fans around New York are saying about Geno Smith getting his jaw broken by his now ex-teammate and the subsequent signing of Annapoli by Rex Ryan in Buffalo. Well, I think the fans' reaction to Rex Ryan signing Annapoli is... Of course. You know, I mean, Rex has a cartoon character way about him. He likes to continue to perpetuate that, and signing mm -hmm. an Impali is a perpetuation of that. So I don't think Jets fans are surprised. I think the Bills are probably the only team who would have signed a player who punched out the starting quarterback. But as far as what happened in the locker room, Look, uh, Jets fans are blaming Geno just as much as they're blaming IKN and Polly because it, you you also have teammates right now who are blaming Geno. You know, we heard Ryan Clark's comments on Mike and Mike, and the more research you do about this, there are stories now that Geno got in the face of an and Polly and said, "I'm not paying," and there's nothing you can do about it. Geno does not have built up clout with this fan base, and he clearly does not have a lot of respect 
in the locker room. Otherwise, I think you would have seen a wave of teammates saying, hey, this is on IK. This isn't on Gino. Instead, you have Darrell Rivas saying, I think the onus falls on both of them. You have Todd Bowles saying it takes two to tango. And the fan base has sort of followed suit and said, hold on a second. Is the guy just going to go up to Gino and cold cock him? He must have done something to provoke him. And that is where Geno Smith's at. He hasn't played well enough, obviously, Hannah, mm -hmm. to build up that kind of collateral with the fan base. Right. So already you have a fan base that's skeptical of Geno. Then you have his teammates not coming to his defense at all. I haven't heard any of his teammates come to his defense. So it leaves the fan base with nothing but blame to throw at Geno the same way they do at IK, the man who actually threw the punch. Yeah, and you hope that that lack of respect, certainly between those two players, and you say it, ex it extends to Geno as teammates. You we hope that that's contained uh, because something like that is very difficult for a locker room to overcome. However, it makes just great times for you uh, on the radio. <laughs> you, you have a lot to talk about. Uh, Ryan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me.